Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have Dr. Melvin Laurie here today, and he is part of our um, team. He is part of our podcast community, and he is has some great insight today. Um, we're going to talk about emotions. We're going to talk about why we have them, our relationship to survival and the reproduction of emotions and how it affects us. And we're going to go over some of the primary uh, reasons uh, why we have uh, emotions and how they affect us in our daily lives. And before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to the Happy Wellness Expo. They are doing an expo in Livingston, New Jersey, and it is top quality products and services will be handed out to individuals and we'll have many doctors and people there to answer any questions about new technologies and new things that are coming out to help individuals. So in our uh, description box, you'll have information about this expo, the Happy Wellness Expo. And if you have any questions, I'll go to the description box and there'll be an email and a phone number where you can contact the person that is in charge of the Happy Wellness Expo. Now, Dr. Melvin, I am so excited to have you back on the show. Every time we, you come on, we have such great uh, in-depth conversations about things that are going on in the world, how they affect us politically, emotionally, um, how it affects you know what's going on and, and the way people are acting out and the way people are interacting with each other. And you know today you wanted to go over emotions. So maybe you know briefly just tell everybody a little about yourself that they haven't you know heard your previous podcast and then we can talk about emotions and why they're so important and what they are and how they affect us as a as an individual and as a community itself. Okay, so I think uh, relevant to this topic, uh, the most basic and important thing about me is that I'm a psychiatrist, and uh, we deal with emotions all the time. So uh, it's, I'm comfortable with this subject. Finally, after a lot of training, I got comfortable with this subject. But I'm, I'm educated in, in genetics and biology, of course. Uh, I even took a fellowship at the Pasteur Institute in Paris and uh, learned a lot more about genetics. Uh, attended a seminar with four Nobel Prize winners. And uh, actually, that gives you a nice sense of confidence that some of your ideas can be okay, because after the Nobel Prize, all of their ideas weren't necessarily great. Mm -hmm. But that's how it goes. You know, that's how it goes. You express them, get some feedback, and uh, the good ones will rise to the top, and the bad ones will fall to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So those are some of my attitudes, as well as my background. So we want to talk about emotions. Yeah, I'd love to talk about emotions. I, you know, I think okay. it's a topic that really is important. It's very interesting also because, you know, everybody is affected with different types of emotions and we go through every day, different, different situations affect our emotions and they affect the way we act, the way we think, the way we react, you know, the way we interact with other individuals. And so this is a great topic to talk about because in our world, especially today, you know, we see a lot of uh, healthy and unhealthy emotions being demonstrated and maybe you can go over, you know, the importance of emotions and explain it in a more um, psychological and, and a more medical way that people can understand and maybe help themselves and, and help the people around them as well. Sure. Well, something that's been uh, really established is there really a consensus on in uh, medicine and biology is that the emotions appear to arise from a certain part of the brain called the limbic system. And there's, there's a little bit known about some of the elements, the smaller structures within this limbic system in our brains, uh, but there's not that much known. And so uh, it, it might become helpful to in the future to deal with people who have conditions that are where they have no emotions, where their emotions are too strong or whatever. But right now, all I'm saying is there's a center in the brain that's considered to be the source of emotions. Now, I want to talk about the issue of semantics when we hear, because I, I'm talking in generalizations. I can't talk to everybody's situations. So I'm talking in generalizations, and uh, there'll be people who disagree with me for sure. There's, there's often a semantic problem uh, when we talk about the basics of things. In other words, if we talk about the primary colors, that uh, they're, we establish red and blue and whatever primary colors. But look what addition there is to red. There's crimson, there's cardinal, there's uh, rose, there's wine, uh, to blue. How about to blue? 
where you have navy blue and you have royal blue, commander blue, many kinds of blue. Right. But, but what ties them together, we, we call blue. And we, what ties these red variations, we call red. Now we'll talk about the emotions and the primary emotions. And they kind of rhyme. So it's, so it's easy to keep track of them. So the, the way we lay it out often is, and I'm going to try to separate what the consensus is in the field and what's my, what are my particular takes. So I think the consensus is pretty much that the primary, they don't necessarily call it primary, but the main emotions are glad, mad, bad, and sad, sad. Uh, so it's easy to remember them. Right. So for example, um, uh, glad. Well, there are lots of shadings of glad. There's happy, there's pleased, there's ecstatic. Mm -hmm. And uh, same with mad, annoyed, I'm bitter, uh, furious. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, they fall in this category of mad, being angry, mad. Uh, well, how about when you feel bad? Um, the, the other term here that's going to come out is uh, fear or anxiety. And there are other words for that, too. Right. We know there are other words for dread, horror, horrified. Yeah. Um, and these are, you know, these are variations on the theme. You can call them uh, for glad. You can call them gladish. Just like for red, you call it reddish. Yeah. This, it helps to talk about the major ones. OK. Glad, mad, bad and sad. Right. Right. Now. I'm going to now I'm going to talk about some things that I really haven't heard talked about or read about. The first question is, why do we have emotions in the first place? Why is this limbic system or whatever else it is? I mean, wh why do we have emotions? Just ask a basic question. Right. When you start to ask these basic questions, you have to start with an answer that's pretty basic. And I keep coming back to survival and reproduction. It's obvious we have to do things and have functions of our bodies and our actions that make for survival. But we also have to pay a lot of attention to reproduction because people die out. Yeah. And if you don't have offspring, then everybody dies out and there's nothing left. Right. So so what so what is it? So what are some of the things that um that survival and, and reproduction have to do. Well, we've talked before about, let's take the survival functions. The main survival functions in humans are to gather resources for the family or for the country. And money is the way we usually discuss this because money can be converted into resources. Well, how do you feel when you make a lot of money? You win the lottery, or you, uh, your business has gets a great new contract, or you get a promotion, you feel happy. That's yeah. glad. That's glad. And if you hit a home run somehow, it's ecstatic. Okay. Yeah. So the emotion is tied to the to the survival and reproductive functions. So let's take that other function outside the nest, which is to protect the nest. A like nest is the family, the neighborhood, mm -hmm. the city, the state, the country, because we humans can see the, the similarities there. Yeah. So if some of the function, so, so let's go back to the function of protecting against intruders. Well, the, those who are focused on what I call outside the nest or survival functions really care a lot about intruders. Like immigration right now, that's the that's the manifestation of this uh, this thing right now, uh, and so some people or some groups of people are really upset those yeah. about this immigration, and they tend to be the ones who's who who focus on outside the nest functions, mm -hmm. making money, the economy, jobs, and protecting the the nest. If you if you don't make much money. If you just miss that contract because somebody else in your department, you know, uh, walked all over you and took credit for it, you'd be mad. Right. And mad. And what does mad do? Mad usually spurs us to get glad. 
Okay, so if we're really mad at somebody who's gotten in the way, an obstacle, we maybe can figure out ways to get rid of that obstacle. And then we can make money, keep intruders out, and we feel glad. Yeah. But what about if we can't, or if it looks like we can't? Right. Then, then we get a little scared. Mm -hmm. That's when we feel bad or concerned. Again, they're shadings. And this is a warning sign that one of our functions is not being fulfilled. Since we're human, we usually, sometimes we walk around nervous or feeling a bad, and we don't know why. And we have okay. to go to a psychiatrist or before that, hopefully friends and family to see why, to get some other perspective. But most of the time we know when things haven't gone right. Oh no, uh, we're not having good enough sales. I could lose my job. Whoa. Well, let's uh, let's look into maybe there's some other jobs around. There are other ways, the various ways of coping with that. But when you're anxious, fearful, concerned, you start to think of these ways to cope. Either you can get get mad or get glad, or maybe you can find an alternative. Right. So it spurs you to action. So let's take the case where you can't, you really can't do the function of, in this case, gathering money. Mm -hmm. You have to go on welfare, feel sad, feel demoralized and depressed. So th this is when you, you're not going to be able to adapt very well. And this is a big problem. We, we kind of touched on this. It's a, a big reason for people who wind up uh, impoverished. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 they have a vicious cycle and they're stuck with uh, uh, depression or hopelessness. And that's what that is. But it's in relation, it's in relation to the outside the nest function of gathering money, resources for the family and or protecting against intruders. Right. Now let's take inside the nest functions. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about inside the nest functions. Yes. These are reproductive functions. We're not talking about sex in terms of intercourse or copulation. Right. We're not even talking about birth. We're talking about from birth onward to adulthood to be, to be able to function in an autonomous way by yourself. And then you can raise a family or have a job, whatever, on your, yeah. on your own. But inside the nest, one of the things that's very important is cleanliness. And here's something people don't know, that little fledgling, I think I might have mentioned this before, but fledgling birds, those little creatures who have to get fed from their parent, yeah, they, they will turn around and deliver their excrement in a little sack. And then the parent takes that out of the nest. So that's that's an animal's way of keeping things clean. Yes. And it's pretty general. Obviously, we keep things clean. We keep our house clean. We keep our neighborhood clean. And then when people come in tents, we don't like it. Right. We are mad, right? We're glad when everything looks fine in the neighborhood or in the city. And we get mad when people get in the way of that. And then what gets in the way of that one thing is people camping out. Right. Um, and again, if we, we, if we, if we really uh, can't even get that downtown to do things, we are a little concerned about what's going on here. And then we might get politically active and see what's, why all these people, where they come from, how come they weren't there 10 years ago and deal with it. Right. And all the way down to uh, sad where, when you can't deal with it, you might move. You have other ways of coping to move up the function to get it done so you can feel glad, right? Whether it's pleased, ecstatic. Okay, you know there's a lot of focus on the environment nowadays, right? Okay, there there are people who feel that we've got to we're going to die if we don't do this, that, or the other for the environment. Those people are fearful. They're yeah. they're afraid that we're going to lose a planet or so, and. Uh, and so they have they're they're feeling bad about things or concerned or fearful or anxious about it. And so what do they do? They sometimes they actually get mad too, and they rev up a lot of people to get in, involved. And uh, you know, the more that they, they they feel satisfied, I don't know when that point will be. They'll probably feel really glad. Okay, so the inside the nest function too. 
is spurred on by emotions. And there's a drive to fulfill the function. And we feel glad then. Well, if we fulfill the function and we feel glad, we're going to do it again. We're going right. to keep it that way. So th the emotion is, is in support of the function. When it, the, Then the function's blocked. You have an emotion anger that will help you deal with whatever it is that's blocking you and you move toward glad. You'll fulfill the function. Yeah. That's the important thing. Well, what about emotional control? Yeah. Well, uh, this is this is something we we learn gradually inside the nest, inside the house, inside the family. The times when the young child throws a tantrum. And you the parent might say, what are you angry about? And the child learns something. The child learns that what he or she is feeling is called anger. Mm -hmm. And then later when that feeling comes around again, the individual can deal with it by throwing a tantrum, but as they get older, more developed, they can deal with it in more productive ways. Right. So their emotions get, get controlled and they get more adept at dealing with their emotions. Uh, anger is a, is a big one. Some people get so angry that they, the way, only way they can cope is by striking out. Yeah. And there are lots of ways of coping with it before that. Often when people uh, when people's minds aren't working just right because they've taken drugs or alcohol, their emotional control is pretty shot. And they'll yeah. do all kinds of things. In fact, uh, there was, a, I think, a police department somewhere that when a person came in intoxicated, they would take a video. This, I guess, back when video was starting. And they'd show the person the video when he was sober and he'd be horrified. Right. You see? So the problem is you lose emotional control when either you're so intensely emotional and can't figure out another way to deal with things or your mind just isn't working right so you can't deal with things. And that, that's, uh, that's, I think, the way to view emotions. We, why, so why do we have them? Why do we have them? We have them because it spurs us on to fulfill the functions that we have genetically determined drives to do, to gather resources, money, to protect against danger, mm -hmm. and to keep things clean. And another thing that happens in the nest is taking care of the vulnerable. Yeah. People who have, people who have a lot of money get a lot of pleasure out of starting foundations. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first things ball players do. They get these huge salaries, and one of the first things they do is start a foundation. Why? Because there's a there's a drive, a genetic drive to care for the vulnerable. And as we said before, I've said before, if we didn't have that drive, then the vulnerable would not do well and die out, and we'd have no 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 species. We'd be gone because every one of us gets vulnerable at different points of time. Right. So. So when people talk about, for example, the haves and the have-nots, mm -hmm. that's how a lot of people see things. Yeah. So the haves are people that are rich, and the have-nots are people who are poor. And now the oppressed comes into the picture. But what really is going on is not the not is not the have-nots. It's the have-nots and certain haves that can move their situation uh, to, toward improvement. If it weren't for the people who had and had a had a feeling, an inside the nest feeling, to, it's just strong enough to right. take care of the vulnerable. It's strong enough, uh, then the poor would just languish. There wouldn't be any progress. There's been a lot of progress over the years, and I think in recent years more so. Mm -hmm. um, but this this is uh, where the emotions come in, so that the the rich person feels good, fulfilled because he's fulfilled the function of caring about the vulnerable. Yeah. Okay. Now, another function inside the nest is that all the offspring have to make it. All the offspring, the survivable, the ones that can survive yeah. have to make it. And it doesn't matter if they're good or bad. 
It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. It doesn't matter if they're strong or weak. The parent will want everyone to make it. Now, this has been translated or manifested in our society in a variety of ways. Uh, over the years, I think uh, the, the Democratic Party, especially, has tried to bring uh, what they consider the oppressed people into the mainstream, at the table, is the expression. Right. And, to, and when they do that, they feel glad. That's their pursuit. And when they can't do that, they might feel mad or they might feel bad, get concerned that they might not be able to accomplish it. So again, the emotions drive it. And then we, with our sophisticated brains that can control our emotions, figure out ways to make the emotion, have, to get the rid of the bad emotion and move toward the, the pleasant or the glad emotion, the fulfillment of whatever that drive is we're talking about. Now, we and you and I have talked about this before, mm -hmm. when there's balance, say in a family, between bringing in resources and uh, giving to the to the offspring, everything's fine. People are glad. Right. You know, they talk about flowers. It used to be you could talk about the weather, but nowadays you can't even talk about the weather. Yeah. So that's <laughs> what it's come to. Yeah. Um, but but in any case, uh, I think you can you can get the idea here. So if it weren't for for our emotions, it's a very it's a very uh, important part of us that that has made us fulfill these functions. And if we didn't have emotions about them, we wouldn't really do much. Are you going to go out and make a lot of money for what? You make enough money, you know, you don't necessarily have to make it for your family, for a family uh, and the environment. Well, you know, you keep your house clean, whatever, but there's nothing more to it. Right. It's the emotions that, that bring out the intensity of it. And the people who are focused on one or another of these functions uh, have emotions associated with them. Uh, so, the, you know, the big picture, big picture here. And you and I have talked also about balance. What's the balance between? Yeah. Actions of the economy and of protection against danger. And the inside the nest, the inside the nest functions of it, keeping the environment clean and having all the children make it. And, the, and when those functions are in balance, people are glad. But suppose the man comes home from his job, but he doesn't, he stops at a bar and spends his money. This was going on a lot. Yeah. Uh, about a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Went to the, uh, to the women's movement and you know we, everything since so there's an imbalance because how's the inside of this parent going to do it's her usually her function right taking care of the kids feeding the kids etc if the outside of this function isn't there got if you're so the inside of this parent is going to be mad and how does the inside the parent cope with it well inside the parent might get on the outside parents but yeah. and and make sure he doesn't stop and spend all his money elsewhere. Right, he makes the focus on the family. That would be a, a adaptive way of coping. Yeah, and that that moves both to a, a period a point of glad. Right, see? and uh, when that can't happen, when there's an imbalance and it can't be corrected, nowadays people might go to couples therapy, but you also see a lot of divorce. Right. People aren't have not been able to reestablish a balance that might have been there initially. Yeah. Uh, and I, I I hope you get the idea. I hope your viewers get the idea that the the emotions are are ha here for a reason, and you have to think of th there being a reason. And the, what and when you ask yourself the reason, you just talk about the most basic functions we have, and how the emotions are tied to them. Right. And I think I think that's that's a way to to approach it. It's a different way from the way emotions are usually perceived and discussed. So 
please, this is not a consensus in the field. It's it's not as if it's not a consensus. Nobody yeah. talks about this aspect of it. Right. And that's why that's why I thought a lot about it. And this this is where I, I stand on it. Yeah. I feel like um what about the you know those people in society that you know they they've uh they've come to these conclusions their own opinions and they are in denial they're not looking at the whole picture they're just looking at what they their beliefs are and they've created emotions around that and they've become so um so engulfed in their own opinions that when they see others act in a certain way that are outside their opinions, their emotions become angered. They become, you know, sometimes they be, they, they get, um, you know, to the point where they want to harm others. They want to, you know, or they'll use, you know, like, you know, very um, hurtful language towards another an individual, which can also hurt people because not everybody has thick skin. And some people, when, when, people say harmful or mean things to other people, it could affect them in, in many ways. It could it could make them angry it, and then it can cause, you know, destruction between the two individuals or it can get, get to the point where they, it makes that person feel um, doubtful of their own selves and their self-worth. And, and also, it, you know, um, you know, when people have gotten so engulfed in their own opinions and they brought it out into society and they said, you're wrong, this is the way it should be, you know, people have even gone to the point where to the extremity of suicide. Like, let's say, you know, when people were talking about same sex marriage, well, you know, there was an outburst, you know, oh, no, 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 you know, God says this, oh, no, 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 this is the way it has to be. And then you know, other people just had their own, their own opinions, you know, this is the way I think, you know, it should be a man and a woman, and that's it. And then you see hatred and anger and you saw violence and, you know, and people had gotten to the point where they were bashed on society, on social media to the point where a lot of people, a lot of young kids, especially were reported from bullying to, to, to commit their, their, you know, to either go into the um, depression or even commit suicide. So, you know, when, you know, we have these emotions, it's, you know, emotions are, can be a beautiful thing and, and it can cause a lot of good things, but in a sense where, you know, when people have um, the emotions that are um, unhealthy, you know, how, you know, how do you, how do you break that cycle when that person only sees the picture within their own little box and their, their actions are really causing a, a, a you know, a really bad, um, you know, destructive atmosphere in our society as a whole. Well, I think this is where leadership comes in and it's not just leadership in terms of government, it's leadership in terms of the entertainment world, the sports world, et cetera. If the leaders can say things like, what are we fighting for? In other words, why is there an imbalance? What are we doing this for? Then, then people can get off it because we tend to follow our leaders. Yeah. And there've been very interesting experiments that show that to the nth degree. But I think most people understand that we do follow our leaders. So if I don't want to mention names, but if a popular singer or actor starts to say one thing about this, people will people will come around and you know it's if you put yourself in the position of the leader you have to realize that the leader can't just say something totally opposite even though it's the right thing to what's going on because it won't be heard and there won't really be any change and that person will no longer be a leader so one thing a leader has to do is gradually figure out how to get followers to move in the direction that they feel is appropriate. And if your leaders aren't saying that, and if your leaders are saying the opposite, then the, then people just are angry that, that no one else uh, believes their belief. So now you've got a situation where the, in our society, where these basic functions have been extended to a ruinous degree, to a ruinous degree. So, the economy has got, had inflation because perhaps because of, of ma poor management, let's say poor economic management. Mm -hmm. the, the police are demoralized. They can't fill their ranks. The military can't fill its ranks. Uh, but the world's also going to come to an end, a lot of people think, in 10 or 12 years. 
if you believe that. Yeah. Um, and there's certain there's certain leaders that are starting to come out of the woodwork. For example, there's a, a Nobel Prize winner who was on the media. So I'll mention his name. His name is John Paulson. When he was a Nobel Prize winner in physics. Mm -hmm. He was talking for a group of 160 scientists that said, yes, there's global warming, but it doesn't have to do with carbon. And it doesn't have to do with humans' effect on it. It's a natural flow of, of warmth and cold in the world. That's just the way it's been going on for many, many years. And this is another example of it. Right. Uh, not too long ago, we were, we were afraid of an ice age. Hmm. And you see how the fluctuations occur. But there's been so much uh, entrenched uh, belief. The consensus is so strong that the planet's going to die if we don't do something. You even hear the leader of the uh, European Union talking in those terms. But when you really talk to scientists, they don't agree. And as a matter of fact, President, oh, I wish I knew, remembered his name, wrote a book. President Obama's chief uh, environmental, what? Al Gore. His chief no, no, I'm, I'm, well, Al Gore is on the other side. I'm talking about oh, okay. scientists now. Oh, scientists. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So, so Obama's chief uh, environmental physicist, scientist, says that. And it's, he says it in a book that these are the ebbs and flows of the, of the universe. And we little people really aren't pushing it one way or the other. We have to adapt to it because it's happening. But it doesn't mean we we go to terrific expense to try to somehow uh, fend it off. It's going to happen anyway if right. it's going to happen. You see the imbalance because there's some all the people that for whom a, um, the environment is a critical thing are furious when other people don't do it right. They think they're wrong and they take means to extend their their uh, function. They right. want the environment pure. And when they get it pure, they feel better. Yeah. Same thing with these, var these various functions. So really, what's going on in society, as you know, I believe is contrived to a large extent. Mm -hmm. And what it's, what's happened is that the, these various functions have been piggybacked and moved to a ruinous extent instead of a balanced. Yeah. To the balanced extent. It, and again, if it happens in the family... For example, if the outside and this parent is working all the time and doesn't isn't come home, that's not balance. Right. The see, see you, you use the example of the family, and a lot of people say, "Well, the the society is not a family. It's not, but it's analogous to a family. It's similar to a family. Exactly. And it's so similar that you can use the the simple uh, explanations that are right in front of us, and and extend them. And when you see what's you'll see what's going on in society. Right. better whether it's what's going on now or what's going on a couple of decades from now so that i think that's that's part of it it's this it's this uh latching on to fundamental drives that are driven to a ruinous extent and when they can't be fulfilled the people that have that are interested in them get mad mm -hmm. and so you have a country that's mad at each other uh I mentioned, I mentioned a, a, a video by an ex KGB mm -hmm. operator named Yuri Bezmenov. It's on YouTube, and he talks about how the Russians, because he defected, he was in KGB, would stir this kind of thing up. Right. They stir up one end of the population to another, and he even says there's stages. He says demoralization. That's happening in the police. Mm -hmm. destabilization well if you live in certain areas you don't know if your store is going to be there the next day because there's so much crime going on or right. if you're going to be injured the next day yeah okay and and uh then the final thing he talks about is civil war and when i when i heard that video i thought that was really far-fetched in america yeah but people are now are starting to worry about something like that because what's going on at the border so you have mm -hmm. half the states in the union feel one way, half the states feel the other. Oh boy, oh boy, <laughs> this is a bigger deal. Yeah, and uh, I don't know where it'll end. 
It takes leaders who are skillful enough to gradually change and move toward a system of balance. Yeah. I, I, and I, and then, and leaders are, you know, I, you could call me a leader, but I don't have many followers like the president does. Right. <laughs> does. Um, because I'm mentioning these things and I do it in kind of a scientific way, but uh, leaders in other fields can do it in their way. Right. But it has to be gradual in order to be successful. It has to start somewhere. Yeah. And uh, people talk about one person standing up can make a difference. It can. There are even experiments, which I might get into another time if you want me to, mm -hmm. on how when one person says or does something, the influence of the, the mob, of the general consensus can can allow individuals to change and then gradually get more individuals to change and you have you can move toward balance yeah cuz i feel like there's a lot of unbalance in in our society right now and i feel like uh even a lot of people that are are claiming to be leaders are throwing out the wrong behaviors and the wrong messages and the wrong emotions and you know as a as a as a, a nation and a democracy we should work, work together as one we don't all have to have the same opinions but there is compromise and we've discussed this in previous conversations where that's what the great thing about America is, is that we can have difference of opinions and we can emphasize what we think is important. But the, the, the overall action is being able to have those emotions where you can be compassionate enough to understand the other person's opinion, take it in for account, and then work together to find one a compromise in the middle that's going to be satisfactory to the majority of our society where you don't see that you see people well if you don't want it my way well you know they get angry and you know you see outbursts and especially in society where you have you're in either politics or you're in leadership you know um you're not supposed to show those type of behaviors you know we're adults and we're supposed to be you know you're you're a leader in the eyes of the public and that's how you should be acting you know in a responsible um manner where you show you know a high level of intelligence a high level of integrity and you show power and you show that you are there to help others, not to harm others. And you see people in, in society, you know, especially in politics right now, coming at each other's throats. And where is that going to get us? What kind of example are you, if you're supposed to be a leader, the followers, our society, the rest of the groups that that get it, that that get influenced by this behavior, what kind of message are you bringing to them? You know, where is this nation going to turn, and what are, what are we going to become if we if we are following this behavior that so called leaderships, you know, leaders are supposed to, you know, exemplify? We have a lot of good leaders, but we also have a lot of leaders out there that aren't so good in our society today and you know change needs to come about and you know where the, i don't you know where they're establishing their emotions and why they are behaving the way they are i'm not sure but it's it's not a good example for our society as a whole no it's true it's, it's terrible if they set the wrong example they're leading in the wrong direction and you're right that happens and so you have people who are stuck at the extremes you know the book i'm finishing now is called Path to Political Peace. Mm -hmm. The people in the middle love it, love the idea. People I, I just talk about with it, they love it because they can't stand the war. Yeah. But guess what's going to happen? If this catches on, people in the middle be happy, but the extremes will be mad. <laughs> they yeah. can't give up their extremes and move toward peace. Right. Well, I, you know, We'll see, we'll see what happens, but I, this is one of the things that can that can really uh, come from this. I think that, you know, you were talking about the value that our society has on open discussion, open speech, and tolerating others. This, I think, has been a, one of the reasons for the success of the Western world. Mm -hmm. And go compare it to Russia or China or Cuba. You can't say the wrong thing. And it's not that so, that the leader can't can't hear it because they they have uh, I don't know if you call them spies yeah. or confidants or whatever monitoring everybody. You don't know if your neighbor's one of them. 
Right. Or your children say the wrong thing to your spouse and children here run off to school and they start talking like that. Um, and people get scared to do what's so functional, which right. is to express ideas and then ultimately reach consensus to go in the, in the appropriate direction to fulfill these functions. This is a reason that those totalitarian states have fallen so far behind the West mm -hmm. is because you don't have the ability to, to, to discuss things. It's a clone over there. And if you dare say the wrong thing, you're in trouble. So people don't say anything. Yeah. And this, by the way, doesn't just happen politically. It happens in school. I, I, you know, as I mentioned to you, I studied in France. This is France. I studied in France. The other students were amazed that I would just raise my hand and ask questions of the professor. It's something natural, something that we do naturally here. But in France, this is not all the way over to China, you right. know, China or Russia. This is France. They were he very hesitant to open their mouth when the professor was talking to say to the professor, well, sir, wh what about this? That, you know, that's all. You know. You're not criticizing the professor from our point of view. You're just asking the professor to elaborate maybe on another aspect of it. So you see, when you have a this cl closed kind of society, it can't move ahead like an open society. We have an open society. And this has been our strength, but it also is turning out to be one of our weaknesses because we are open to all people that are coming in, for example, at the border, and there's so many people upset about that, that you have this extreme of and anger going yes. on. That, and I think that, you know, we've talked about sunlight also. Mm -hmm. Sunlight, so this is leadership in the press. Sunlight, by, by talking about what's going on, then people who, aren't necessarily that versed in it or are interested in other things can put that into perspective and not get caught up yes. in the extreme. So this is why uh, leaders and uh, communicators like the media. Another thing that's happened, I think, in our society is the social media. Yeah, It's really had a big influence, especially on the youth. doesn't have an influence on me because I don't really do it. Right. So... So, you know, I, I and I don't know exactly how they do it, but in, it, it's been said that we should have this the social media because it's like standing on the soapbox in the park and spouting your opinion. People can walk by and not listen or a crowd can gather and listen if you're making some sense. Yeah. This is different. People can do these things anonymously mm -hmm. and therefore they, they don't need the emotional control that otherwise yeah. would be there. And they don't have to, they, they don't get good questions that can maybe alter their opinion a little bit. It's anonymous. It's easy to strike out. Nobody yes. knows who you are. So these are, these, and then, you know, Elon Musk is, is trying to deal with this by trying to eliminate uh, bots, fake, fake um, accounts, fake, fake people. Mm -hmm. um, he's one person who's in a position to do it. And I think he's trying to do it. Um, and he's a leader. He, he he's a leader because he's 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 someone we all recognize as very successful. And so when he says or does something, it's got a lot of worth to it. Right. So he's he is a leader in terms of having a true discourse and not having a lot of fake accounts influence things one way or the other. Well, we'll see if that works. If we had more leaders like that. Uh, more, more, there'd be more of a chance to come off the extremes and kind of get back in balance. Right. I don't know if I'm getting too wordy, but uh, no, those are my words. Mm -hmm. So, I I agree. I think it, it's it's you know um, it's great to have emotions. Emotions help us. They they help us um, you know focus and they and 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 help us you know move forward in life and progress and to. You know, but we just have to make sure that, you know, um, 
that we have that we are all on the same page and and there are so many people that you know have mental health issues and many people that have gone through trauma in the life and have repressed emotions and and they don't display emotions in the proper way and um you know we have a, a lot of issues where people you know that have mental illness you know are are go off and and their brain doesn't function properly and their emotions are not constructive either you know and you know, we've seen a lot of that, even with the gun violence, you know, a lot of these people, you know, they, they, they do things that, but their, their mind isn't, in, isn't set right, you know, and, uh, you know, their emotions aren't properly displayed, you know, and, and in their head, they see everything. It, 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 it looks fine. You know, their world, they see everything, you know, they see everything perfect, but in the real world, in the overall picture, you know, this is not the way society reacts. This is not the way society behaves. Again, we go back to not, you know, not having that happy middle, that peace you're talking about, that you're writing about in your book. And, you know, and they're trying to get their message across by doing something to the extreme, their anger, whatever it has influenced them whether it's a mental illness or they're in these conspiracy groups on social media and they're getting influenced by other people's opinions, those followers again, and they're reacting in, in, in a violent manner instead of a peaceful manner. You know, they don't have the uh, control of their emotions um, that I, I tried to mention at the end of this, because it's one thing to have them, but it's the question is how you control them and modulate them and have them come out in yeah. ways that are productive toward moving toward glad, moving toward glad, fulfillment of these of these goals. Um, and by the way, the balance is also something that we need. And if we don't have it to society, we're in trouble. Yeah. The, the body has a phenomenon called homeostasis. Mm -hmm. that, that means that if one aspect of the body is out of whack, another aspect will make up for it. The example is the thyroid, if the thyroid's uh, too low, then there's a hormone in the brain that can get it moving again, reestablish homeostasis. Yes. But what about sociostasis? Sociostasis, doesn't mean static. It just means things are in balance. If one thing gets out of balance, you can co cope with it. Yeah. That's that's what, we, that's what we've had. It's another word for what we're talking about here. Yeah. Okay. And the mechanism for sociostasis is democracy. That's simple. Maybe it was luck, maybe it was skill, but those founding fathers, you know, they got it right enough for us to have a really great, beautiful society. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it, it doesn't allow for people to exploit that and ruin it. We just have to know that so we can not let, not let that happen. Yeah. I agree with you. I think I think we have to be aware and not let it happen. And, you know, that was my biggest fear is sometimes when I look at society and I see the direction, you know, that our 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 government is going and, and the way people are reacting in our democracy, sometimes it would worry me and it would scare me. And, you know, but if we work together and we realize, you know, um, and we don't get influenced and we realize what, you know, what we originally were founded on. And we, you know, which was, you know, democracy is a beautiful thing when it's used in 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 a in a, in the right way, you know. And if we can keep that that you know structure together and repeat that structure that was founded many moons ago, you know, we will have a you know continue to be that great country that we are. It's just you know not getting diluted with all these different opinions and thoughts and and un, unhealthy behaviors and really focusing on how we were founded and keeping that structure and building on that structure and not getting you know um, dissoluted with other other you know issues that you know and, and other conspiracies and other thoughts and other opinions. But think about how we were founded. I think as a, as a nation and trying to stay structured within that that circle that we were we were first founded on. Yeah, we can no longer take it for granted. We've got to recognize it and we've got to start doing something about it. And as we've said before, you know, the recognition is the sunlight. It's mm -hmm. the best antiseptic. And um the sunlight now 
is podcasts. Yeah. Is social media. Mm -hmm. TV is kind of waning. Newspapers are waning. They're still in there. But with each medium that arises, that's the, that's our chance yeah. for sociostasis. I agree. Really. I agree. Now, if you had to give a couple of takeaways before we go, what would you really like the listeners to really um, to understand from the, the discussion that we had today and really take in mind? Okay. So I think number one, it's important to try to categorize emotions. They might be slightly different, but there are primary ones. And I've laid them out as glad, mad, bad, and sad. And these that these emotions are there to help us adapt better and fulfill our drives, whether they're the out, the outside the nest or inside the nest drives to have a have a system where the next generation can carry on in a functional way. Um, emotional control is the other thing. If you let your emotions get out of control, you, you'll have imbalance because other people don't necessarily agree with every little thing you think. Like mm -hmm. a child who has a tantrum, the mm -hmm. world's not stopping for that child who has a tantrum. So it's emotional control that has to be skillful, but utilized. And that helps us stay in balance. When it's out of balance, it drives one pole, people to one pole or the other. And, you know, it's, it makes things worse. So I think emotional control and to see that the emotions have a reason to be there. And the reasons are to do the basic things in life that we have to do to survive. Yes, I agree. You know, um, I, I think those are great takeaways. I think those are uh, that's a great um, summarization of what we talked about. And, you know, if people can follow those those suggestions, I think, you know, it could help, you know, improve our society from where we are right now to where we can be in the future. And also you have several books that are available that you've written and you've written. Um, where can people find these books? Oh, certainly on Amazon. Um, there's one that's on depression. It's called Depression, Your Questions Answered. And it's written at a level, I think, that most people uh, can, can find resonate with their situation or people they know who have gone through depressions. Uh, the other one is called Psyche Politics, which is too dense for the average person. <laughs> the title is as well, but it's, it's the application of, of psychology to politics has not been written on that. My take, my, it brings in different things. That's called psyche politics. Right. The next one, I decided to give a juicy title <laughs> called Sex in Politics. And you can find that in Amazon. You can find all these in Amazon. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, on Amazon and Kindle. It's short, it's quick because it's a summary. And, it, uh, and now in the book I'm writing, I'm applying the principles laid out in the sex and politics book to this issue of political peace. Yes. And I, I look forward to, to reading that book. When is that book um, going to be uh, uh, launched? Because I know that they're working right now on finalizing. You're putting all the piece, little pieces together before you launch it. When do you expect the book to come out? Well, I hope it can come out uh substantially before the election so people can use some of these thoughts when they make their decisions uh, i'd be very sad if it doesn't but you know what there are always elections they're political elections but there are elections in the union there are elections in communities there are elections in clubs and so politics is there at various levels right. and the, the book is designed to address principles that can be adapted to the different levels. So the answer to your question, it can't come out soon enough, but you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not optimistic that it will come out before the election or enough before the election to, um, to make a difference, but there are other elections. That's, that's it. 
Well, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and hope that book comes out on time. So, you know, people could actually read it and then maybe get some input and, and maybe a couple of light bulbs will go off and see and maybe see things from different perspectives instead of the only perspective they have in their brain right now. So, you know, open minded, you know, like as we talked, it's great to be open minded and, and to, you know, really look at things, not just from your own perspective, but take in other people's perspective. It doesn't mean that their perspective has to be right, but to be able to think about it, take it in and see how it may apply to your own life can be very beneficial as well. So it's always good to try to keep that open-mindedness and uh and to really apply a lot of the, the the information that you've you've supplied today i think it's great you know and emotions you know especially nowadays emotions are very powerful and when we learn how to use them and use them in the right way and understand what they are and how we can benefit from them you know, and when we do go through life and we do hit emotions that may not be positive emotions, how can we constructively turn them into positive emotions so we can move forward in life and not move backwards? And that's the goal is not to move backwards, not to, you know, try to rewrite history because history is the past and we can't change the past, but we can focus on the present and we can learn about our emotions and learn how to constructively turn them into positive, strong emotions that will build a nation that is meant to be you know, a powerful, you know, constructive nation that does good things for us and for our allies. So today has been an amazing uh, show. I thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts and your ideas. Uh, this has been really uh, a very constructive and very uh, powerful uh, podcast. And thank you so much for taking the time to come out and, and to share your thoughts and your ideas. And we're honored to have you as part of our team member and, and to have you take the time to explain these things to society and make society think of things from different perspectives and not only their own perspective. Well, pleasure to be here. And again, um, I hope your audience gets something out of it. I'm sure hope. they will. I'm sure they will. Thank you, Dr. Laurie. It's always a pleasure to have you. Sure. Take care. You too.